Am I on? Hello everyone. Uh, this is Tim Bird and I'm coming to you from my basement uh, due to COVID-19. Uh, if I keep this mask on the entire time, it's going to be kind of ridiculous, but I thought I'd start with some fun. Uh, hopefully you're, uh, uh, you're enjoying the conference and have had a good time. Okay, that's enough of this. <laughs> hopefully that just sets the stage for uh, the uh, um, that sets the stage for, uh, gotta turn that off. I'm hearing the sound in the other speaker. Uh, that sets the stage for the amount of fun we're gonna have today. Um, if you have not been to a uh, closing game session of Embedded Linux Conference, it's time for us to just unwind a little bit and relax and have some fun. That's why I have my dumb bird mask. I, I didn't think I could wear that at a regular event because walking up to the stage, I wouldn't have enough vision. I'd probably trip and fall, although that might be fun uh, for everybody else. <laughs> it's a bad way to start off the session. Uh, so let me talk about what we're going to do today. Uh, the conference is over. I hope you had a good time. And uh, but at, in this session, we're going to do uh, something a little different. Uh, I have some closing games prepared for you. Um, but before we get started with that, I, I need you to do a little bit of prefetching. In order to play the games, uh, you're going to need to find your event confirmation number. So that's the number you've been using all week to log in to ELC. That uh, It's actually a string of, of uh, letters and numbers, uh, but that should be in your registration confirmation email. I'm going to keep talking for a minute while you uh, go ahead and look for that. Just make sure you have that ready because uh, you're going to use it to, to join the game. So uh, I want to get started with uh, just a big thank you to everyone who makes this event possible. Uh, obviously, um, it takes a lot of work to put on an event like this. Even a, uh, You would think that a virtual event would be less work, but that's not the case at all. I know the, uh, uh, it, takes, uh, it takes a whole lot of effort on a lot of people's part. So I want to say a big thank you to the sponsors um, in particular. Uh, I want to take, thank uh, IBM as a diamond sponsor. Uh, and I want to thank uh, our platinum sponsors, Cloud Native Computing Foundation, Google, Red Hat, SUSE, uh, and then our gold sponsors, AWS and VMware. And uh, we also have silver sponsors. I'm not going to read all of these, but uh, thank you to them as well, as well as some bronze sponsors. Um, and so uh, those are the organizations that have supported this event and made it possible for us to uh, get together well, virtually, uh, but there's also uh, other people behind the scenes. Uh, the program committee, I want to say a special thanks to them. Uh, some great individuals who helped us uh, figure out the content for this event. Um, and also, uh, I want to thank the speakers. Uh, we, the, this event really, the content of the event really comes uh, a lot from the speakers and the great technical content that they bring uh, every year. Um, and uh, I want to thank you as attendees uh, for for uh, participating. Uh, I know the Slack channel has been very active, and uh, we've had lots of good comments, lots of good Q and A in the sessions. Um, and uh, just uh, by your participation, you've helped uh, make the event better. And then finally, we have to give a shout out to the Linux Foundation event staff. Uh, they always do just a great professional job. Uh, I've been super impressed. Uh, this is not an easy thing to switch over from, uh, uh, you know, a venue-based event to a virtual event. Uh, we just really appreciate the fact, uh, all the hard work they've done um, making all of this stuff possible. So, uh, now with uh, those thank yous out of the way, uh, we have prepared a closing game. Uh, there is a URL, closinggame.net, uh, that I want you to go to. Uh, there's a very simple page, and you can click on the red-green game, and you should be presented with a form, and you will need to register uh, and create an account on that site very quickly. So use your event confirmation number uh, that I asked you to look up previously. Uh, decide on an account name. This is a user alias. It doesn't matter what it is. It's just a short uh, name for yourself, whatever you're most comfortable with. It will. It is possible that that user alias will be displayed. So try to pick something um, 
well, how can I put it? Inoffensive. Uh, the other things that I would like on there, just in case you win, we need your real name and your email address. And we could match those up after the event, uh, but uh, we want to make sure that we've got redundancy here. In case you win a prize, we really want to make sure that you that you are able to receive it. So you can see you can start registering. I'm see people registering right now. Once you register, you'll be putting into kind of on a waiting page and just kind of hold there for a while. Um, so some housekeeping uh, before we get started as as people are registering. So the present there's a presentation page already made available at ELC 2020 presentations. Uh, so uh, some slides are already there. Uh, uh, Bill Trainer has been uploading them as they appear on uh, Schedge.com. Uh, so please submit your your talk or your slides to Schedge.com, or if you want to, you can load them yourself. Uh, you can create an eLinux wiki account. It's just like Wikipedia. Um, on, if you go to Schedge.com, there's a button called Manage Session. Uh, so make sure your slides are available. We don't want to hunt you down. Um, and we prefer to get the PDFs up there. All of the sessions were recorded, and uh, they'll actually be available to you for a whole year on this conference uh, system. Uh, and they'll also be, ama be made available to the public uh, starting tomorrow. Uh, people will need to register, but it will be free. And then the, the videos will also eventually be put on YouTube. So I think that's a, a great system. You can start recommending videos uh, to your friends and start referencing those. And as soon as they get on YouTube, we'll put the links on the, the presentations page. So now some interesting news about Embedded Linux Conference Europe. Unfortunately, we have made the decision that uh, this year it will be a virtual event. It was planned for October in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, we were kind of watching uh, the first couple of weeks of summer here to see what happened with COVID-19, but it looks like uh, there still be a lot of travel restrictions in place. And so uh, we're planning on doing at the same dates, but a virtual event just like this one. Uh, the CFP for that closes July 26th. I know if you're a speaker, you're probably um, you're probably uh, just you know right at the period where you're uh, breathing a sigh of relief having finished your talk. Uh, but you know, give it a couple of weeks and then send us a send us a, a, a proposal for a paper or a talk or a BOF or, or a panel or something like that. We'd love to have you uh, participate in our Embedded Linux Conference Europe this year. So our plans after that are Embedded Linux Conference 2021. Uh, we're shooting for August uh, 4 through 6, that should be 2021 in Vancouver, Canada. So next summer, hopefully all of this COVID stuff is behind us, but uh, you know we'll see. And then Embedded Linux Conference Europe 2021, this is the first time we've ever gone uh, like a year and a half out with announcements. We think it'll be October. Don't, we don't have the dates pinned down for sure, but we're going to try again for Dublin, Ireland. So we're going to do take two on that. Uh, we're looking to add uh, virtual elements to future events uh, to enhance them with lessons learned from this experience. So we've learned a lot uh, about how to uh, have virtual events. Um, and we're very excited, actually, with the extended reach that it provides. And so we're looking at uh, ways that we can take some of the things that we're doing and uh, with this event, and even when we go to live events, to uh, use that experience to, to uh, enhance the conference. OK, so now let's get down to it. We're going to start playing some games. Uh, I, I like to tell people I like games where everyone has a chance to win. Uh, we have some games that are skill based. Loosely, loosely uh, stated. Uh, anyway, and then we have some that are just pure luck. Uh, the basic outline is uh, when we do this in person, we have a whole room full of attendees. They stand up and we kind of whittle them down. Uh, people who who answer correctly get to continue standing, and then and then the winners are selected to come up and get a prize. Uh, so we're going to do a similar type of thing, but it's all online this time. So, uh, like I said, normally we play this in person, but the big overview here is register online. I see we've got over 200 registrations already. Um, we're going to answer some questions. This is the red-green game, which means normally we hold up pieces of paper uh, to show our answers, but uh, now you'll just be clicking on the screen. Not quite as exciting. Hopefully you'll win a prize, um, and uh, that will be great. The, the interesting thing is I think the conference is only $50. I think the lowest value prize we have is $50. So there's a very good chance. Well, there's uh, if you win, you will end up offsetting the complete cost of your attendance at this conference. So that's actually a pretty good deal. 
Um, let's see. So the probability of success. If you have come to ELC before, you know that uh, we uh, having hiccups and problems with the closing game is kind of a tradition. Uh, this year will be no exception, I, I anticipate. Uh, we use, uh, I had a kind of a homebrew handwritten web script. Uh, I tried some technologies that I've never tried before, uh, WSGI, Nginx, and some auto refresh polling. Uh, by the way, uh, Behan Webster is providing the web server for this. There's an old adage in the trade show business uh, when doing a demo, you should never try something you've never tried before. Well, at Embedded Linux Conference during the closing game, we always try something we've never tried before. Uh, I didn't have time to rigorously test it. The chances that it's going to work under load are uh, kind of low. But let's see what happens. I've got some uh, monitors on another computer here. I'm kind of watching what's going on. Uh, we, the server hasn't fallen over yet. Um, and so uh, let's see. So the, the thing is, what's at stake? And I want to I want to comment here. We have some LWN.net certificates. Uh, LWN.net, always give a shout out to them. They have great material. Uh, and you should really be a reader of them and a subscriber to help support them financially. We have a bunch of gift cards uh, donated by the Linux Foundation, and we have some uh, late breaking uh, uh, also donations for prizes from companies. Uh, I'll mention those here. Uh, we have a $250 Amazon gift card that's been donated by Red Hat. Thank you, Red Hat, for that. Google has uh, produced an open source swag bag, so a bag containing a bunch of open source stuff. That's an actual physical gift that we're gonna we're gonna ship to someone. Uh, and then we have a $50 Amazon gift card donated by Amazon Web Services. So uh, thank you to Red Hat, Google, and Amazon, and the Linux Foundation uh, for providing some, some prizes. Um, so our very first game is going to be a game of trivia. It's Embedded Linux History, Technical, and Nerd Trivia. And there's always a qualifier on this that I think is important for people to, to realize, and an important disclaimer. This game is not fair. Uh, it's uh, I, I apologize in advance. Some people are going to be uh, upset the, uh, with the answers, but uh, the decisions of the judges is final. Um, this year, because we're doing it online, uh, if for some reason you can't register, <clears throat> there are a limited number of guest accounts that you can use. Uh, I don't. We, we're not going to be able to uh, chip prizes to any of the guest accounts, but if you want to play along and you haven't been able to register, you can use a guest account called, uh, instead of the confirmation number, you use guest, G-U-E-S-T, uh, X-Y-Z, where X-Y-Z is a number from one, uh, 100 to 99. So a three-digit number not starting with a zero and just all one word. Use that as your confirmation number. You just have to guess and hope that you don't collide with someone else. I put a 1,000 of them in, I, but I didn't put... Uh, collision stuff. So Philip Ballister is asking for the URL again. So let me let me re, uh, recite the URL. It's closing game all one word dot net, and that's all you need. It's an https slash slash closing game dot net uh, slash, and then you'll there's a link there that will take you to slash rg. But you just need to get to the server, and you should be pretty easy to get there. So I'll give people like one or two more seconds to. To register, oops, I, I went to the slide, the first question. Wow, hope, hopefully people didn't see that. Um, but that's actually my throwaway question. So we'll, so, okay, so let's get started. This should be, this should be fun. And I have to multitask here because I'm running the game on another computer. Um, but uh, let's start the trivia game. So uh, let's see, all right here. Okay. What is the latest re released Linux kernel? Is it green 5.7.6 or red 5.8 RC5? And I give people just a couple of minutes to answer that. Well, not a couple of minutes. Uh, so I don't want people. Oh, by the way, don't be looking stuff up on Google. I know you're all at home. You could have another screen up and you could be researching this stuff, but it's uh, it's no fun if you cheat. Um, so. Uh, or uh, cheat is a harsh word. Uh, it's uh, don't uh, artificially enhance your opportunity to win. Uh, so I think we're doing pretty good on on answers. Uh, we've got over 200 people have answered. 
Um, oh, by the way, and if you do come in late, uh, the the game resets in the middle. So just because you get eliminated, don't don't give up. Okay, so the answer to this question is, let's see here. The latest kernel release on kernel.org is 5.7.6. So uh, the release candidates don't count as release kernels. Uh, so that was a little bit of a tricky question. It says it right in their names. Uh, besides, the re current release candidate is not RC5, it's it's RC3. So uh, so you, you know that couldn't be the right answer. So guess what? I'm going to give all everyone, I'm going to give you that question for free. If it says on your screen that you're eliminated, uh, don't worry about it. I'm about to restore you uh, and see what happens here. Hopefully, this will restore people. Uh, okay, so we gave you that question for free. And as your screen resets, hopefully you'll get um, you'll you'll get next to still in. Oh, wait, what happened? Still in count is only one. Oh, of course, <laughs> of course. Uh, well, of course, of course that didn't work. Uh, I wrote that this afternoon. I don't know what the problem is. I'm gonna manually take care of that. Just give me a second. Uh, hold on here. Uh, okay, now uh, refresh your screens. If, if by the way, if you if you fall out, let me see here. Wow, is the server falling over? No? Wow, what happened? Okay. Okay, let me try this again. One last try. Sorry, people, we're gonna have to play through that question. That I'm not sure what happened to the still in count. Well, okay, people are back in now, but we're back to question one. Uh, so ignore this question. What a disaster. It's, it's the same every time. Okay. Okay, now everyone knows the answer this time. Uh, let's see. Okay, so everyone answer the correct one this time, which is 5.7.6. I'm waiting for answers to roll in. Not sure what happened there on the still in. Uh, dang. <laughs> okay, got a lot of people answered, but not everyone, but I, get, I do got to... Uh, <laughs> I've got I've got people slacking me some stuff. Uh, appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> okay, so uh, let's go to the next question. Let's just see. Okay, um, there we go. Okay. 1968, Edgar Dijkstra had the letter published in Communications of the ACM state, uh, with the title, Go-To Statement Considered Harmful. In 2020, how many go-to statements are there in the Linux kernel source code? Is it less than 180,000 or more than 180,000? So answer this question and let's see. <clears throat> Not sure what happened to my still in backup system. Okay, I can't let these questions run too long because people could be running little git search commands or something. Although it should take you longer than uh, 50 seconds to figure this, this one out. Okay, I'm gonna call this one. Uh, and the answer is, it's less than 180,000. So the answer was green. Uh, there are uh, 168,000. Uh, so, and you can find that out with a, a very simple command there, find command. Um, okay, so we've got 111 people still in, so let's keep going. Uh, let's see. Okay, so the papers and notes from uh, Edgar Dykstra's career are housed in Austin, Texas. Is that true or false?
By the way, if you're if you're eliminated, you can still answer the question. In fact, you should if you want to keep current with the game. Uh, you just won't be eligible for a prize this round. But don't give up. Uh, the prizes will be – you will be allowed to, to do a prize uh, in a future round. Okay, so I'm uh, going to give it maybe 10 more seconds. Okay, and the answer is true. So Dykstra's last job was in the computer science department. Uh, oh, let me make sure this goes, there you go. Dykstra's last job was in the computer science department at the University of Texas at Austin, and you can find his archive there. Dykstra took a lot of really careful notes uh, during his career, and he's, he was a really brilliant man, had a lot of uh, great uh, insights. Okay, so. Next question. Uh, let me do this here. The warning against lines that are too long for the Linux source contributions was recently changed. That part I can guarantee you is true. It was changed from its old value to 120 columns. Is that true or false? Yeah, you can't see the numbers uh, climbing, uh, but I can. I should have put that in the screen, but I was, I was really worried about load on the server. Here we go. So I'm going to have to let this go now. And the answer to that one is false. It was, it was only modified to 100 characters, not 120. Notice that the 80 character max is still prefer, uh, preferred. Um, and uh, I did a little bit of math on this, extrapolating from the timing of this change. Uh, I think we, I think we'll see the limit go up to 120 uh, on March 9th, 2049. About every uh, 30 or so years, we'll increase by 20 characters. Uh, so uh, let's look at the next uh, question. In the 4.x series of Linux kernel, was it possible to configure an ARM kernel smaller than 700,000 bytes? That's text BSS and or text data BSS. That's uh, obviously the static size of the kernel. So just how just how good do you think the uh, Linux Tiny project has been over the years? And. Uh, I think I'm going to go ahead and show the answer. And the answer is yes. Uh, Michael Optenacker ha had a session at ELC 2017 where he showed a kernel with a footprint of under about 600,000 600, bytes. Uh, we still got about 19 people still in the, in the round. So we're going to keep going. And this is a question that's much more recent. This is based on Linus's keynote just this week. Uh, his keynote chat. Linus said in his keynote session that much work in operating systems is based on principles from the 1960s. Uh, and he mentioned one thing in particular uh, as one technology that might require new ideas in the kernel. Was it green quantum computing or red artificial intelligence? Okay. For this one, you have to have you have to have been paying pretty close attention, and you have to uh, have a good memory. Let's go ahead and show the answer. The answer was artificial intelligence. Okay, so get this. We're down to seven people. Should I do one more question? Oh, I usually ask the audience, and I get feedback. I, there's no way to do that on this one. Um, so let me. Uh, should I go ahead and declare some winners or should I do one more question? I know the people who are still in are going, come on, declare winners. I'm going to do one more question. <laughs> oh, this is a good question too. Uh, let me see here. It is estimated that how many Linux-based computers are currently in outer space counting interplanetary probes? Okay, counting interplanetary probes. So is that less than 65 or more than 65? Okay, I'm going to be really upset if uh, the seven that we're still in it get this wrong. 
<laughs> because uh, I, I don't have good uh, pr processes in case everyone gets eliminated. Okay, so the answer to this one is pretty interesting. It's uh, more than 65. There's currently 32,000, over 32,000 uh, computers in outer space running Linux. Each SpaceX launch of Starlink satellites adds about 4,000. Uh, it is estimated that in a few years, there will be over 2 million Linux computers in low Earth orbit. Uh, and uh, so I say, uh, if you combine this with uh, Linus's last thing, where we add some AI to the kernel, uh, I think we should call the system Skynet. Two million uh, AI nodes up in the sky, what could go wrong? <laughs> okay, oh, so we have officially uh, three people still in, so we're gonna declare the winners. So uh, here's here's the winners. Uh, Renato, Niran, and Ellis L. Smith. Uh, you guys have officially won a prize, and we will contact you after the event to uh, tell you how to obtain your prize and which, which prize you've won uh, or what the process is for, for that. So the good news for everybody is that means that everybody is back in the game. If you are out, you're back in. So people should be still in. Okay, I'm gonna take just a quick look at the questions. Oops, what happened? Okay. Okay, so the next question. It will be hard to use a Nexus 4 Android phone in the year 2040. Is that true or false? Hey, the answers are coming in. It's not quite as fun as when you can't see the people holding cards right next to you. Of course, <laughs> if you can't see the people holding cards right next to you, you can't... Uh, this is this one's a pretty easy one uh, because uh, the well the issue one it will be an old phone at that point but uh, Android in that era was subject to the year twenty thirty eight bug okay when I say that era that was not that long ago but uh, luckily phones that are being built now should be a lot more resilient uh, Arn Bergman and a lot of other people have worked really hard to to fix year twenty thirty eight problems but uh, back in the day you can actually So I know that the oh no audio have we have we lost audio oh it's back okay sorry I uh, I'm watching uh, a lot of stuff right now okay it looks like we have a fair number of people who have answered this question so I'm going to show the answer uh, get your answer in quick the answer is less than two uh, this is a trick question. The Linux Foundation does not, to my knowledge, have a uh, kernel documentation team. Uh, so that uh, you can see a picture of the team right there. Uh, sorry, that's a joke. It's kind of a bad joke. I actually, uh, the Linux Foundation has had people working on kernel documentation in the past. I'd like to see them do some more stuff there. Uh, but uh, oh wow, a lot of people, a lot of people got eliminated on that one. Um, okay, so next question. In April, an educational computer kit uh, based on the Raspberry Pi 4 was released that was built and marketed by an 11-year-old child. Is that true or false? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead. Once we get over 200 answers, I uh, feel like I'm gonna go the answer. Although if you haven't submitted it, get it in quick. Okay, here we go. The answer is false. Okay, so there was a box it's called the Sanya box, embedded computer kit, did go on sale re recently based on a Kickstarter campaign. It was designed to be, as being sold by a 13 year old, not an 11 year old. Uh, 
she's a young woman from India named Sonia Jane uh, and includes a custom shield and some stuff. It's like, I saw this, uh, it's just amazing. I think it's remarkable. Uh, I think she's to be commended. Uh, I, I feel like uh, when, when I was in my youth, I was not putting together STEM kits for, uh, you know, educational purposes. Uh, you know, I feel like my youth was kind of misspent. Um, so uh, let's go one more question. Ah, remember the Alamo. Unfortunately, we'll be missing out on the opportunity to visit one of the most historic sites of Austin, Texas, the Alamo. In what year was the famous Battle of Alamo fought in Austin? Was it 1836, 1841, or neither of those years? Notice the Austin theme. So I start thinking of these questions way back uh, and even before the COVID hit. So we were going to be in Austin and we're going to miss seeing, seeing the Alamo. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, show the answer. The answer is fall or is uh, neither of those years because uh, there was a, the Battle of Alamo was fought in 1836, but the Alamo mission is not located in Austin, Texas. It's located in San Antonio, Texas. So how many, how many people did I wipe out with that one? Oh, gosh. <laughs> uh, sorry, that was a trick question. If you Googled it, you probably did not check this, the city. But we're going to go ahead and declare three more winners. Uh, Rymar, Feckert, and Delek. Okay. Three more winners. So let's congratulate them. Hey. I know you're at home. It's kind of a meaningless gesture. But, um, so let's go ahead to the next question. Uh, the best evidence we have uh, that Sasha Levin and Greg Crow Hartman have lost their minds is one of these things. They wrote a new event notification system for the kernel or they increased the LTS support lifetime. What are they thinking? And uh, sorry, all you embedded Linux people who are working on stuff outside the kernel. I'm kind of a kernel guy, so this is kind of a kernel heavy focus on these questions. Okay, the answer to this one is, and you're gonna be disappointed if you just got in and, and you get out right again. Uh, the answer is red. Uh, let's see here. They increased the LTS support lifetime. They increased it by four years for two two additional kernels. So now if you look at that, all of the LTS kernels have six year support life cycles. That is crazy. Um, I really don't know how Greg and Sasha do it. Um, by the way, there is a new event notification system uh, in, I think it was either 5.8 or 5.7, uh, but that was added by David Howells. Uh, so let's go to the next question. Okay, what was the first commercial embedded Linux distribution? I know there are some oldies out there who uh, remember this era, but do they remember the exact ordering? Um, so there's your answers are between MonoVista Hardhat Linux, TimeSys Linux, or Lineal Embedix. There are three commercial embedded Linux vendors. Um, let's, I gotta wait for some more answers to, to come in. Yeah, I wonder if I need to increase the number of processes. They should be coming in faster than that. Oh, well. I'm not going to do that live. <laughs> I'm not going to fundamentally alter, uh, alter the configuration for my U, micro US WSGI thing. Um, okay, so the answer to this one uh, is Lineo Embedics is the correct answer. So if you look at the release dates, they all came out in 2000 and Lineo only beat Monta Vista by about uh, six, uh, seven days. Um, the, the thing about that is both of the, all of these companies were working with companies with uh, their customers uh, before these dates, but these are their official release dates. So it's actually kind of hard to pin down when each of these is, but 
I'm going with the official press releases from each com uh, company. The interesting thing about this is that Embedded Linux is now 20 years old. That is just mind blowing. Uh, who would have thought in the year 2000, we'd be where we are now with, with literally billions of nodes of Linux. Uh, I think I'd like to declare 2020 as the year of embedded Linux. I don't know if the desktop year will ever come, uh, but, uh, but by gum, we're gonna, uh, we've done just fine in embedded. Okay, here's a fun one. Then the rise of Skywalker, Ray continues her training under which Jedi? Is it Leia Organa or Plo Koon? Okay, the answers are coming in. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and show the answer. Here we go. And it was Leia Organa. Uh, so in the movie, Leia trains Rey to become a full-fledged Jedi. Also, in some brief footage, we see Leia's own Jedi training with Luke. Uh, hopefully, if if you have not seen this movie, uh, I apologize if that's a spoiler. Uh, I don't think it's a major plot point, but it's kind of a nice little bit of trivia. Um, so our next question. The Octo project has its roots in the RPM package management system. Uh, is that true or false? The Octo based on RPM? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and show the answer. And the answer is false. Bitbake was actually based, uh, inspired by Portage, which came from came from Gentoo. Uh, and so, wow, okay, still in count. We got one more question maybe. I think we got 14 people left in the game. Uh, that one took out a lot of the remaining people. Busybox, was Busybox initially created for MMUless systems? U UC Linux, is that true or false? Okay, the answer is false. Busybox was actually created for Debian boot floppies, which did have a size constraint, but uh, not, not as bad as the UC Linux size constraint. So this thing that we're uh, using in almost uh, every embedded product, well, except for Android. Android switched over to Toybox, but uh, that came from uh, boot floppies. Uh, which is a good place for it. And we have six people remaining, so I'm going to go ahead and declare those people winners. So these are the winners from this round. Okay. So I think we'll, we have time for one more game of trivia, and then we're going to switch to our second game, which is all chance. So uh, you will just go ahead and do the next question. Okay, so what embedded Linux build system does SpaceX use? Uh, oh, and by the way, I just, SpaceX is like cool, isn't it? And it's like, okay, you know, I don't mean to disparage other uh, space companies, but uh, the fact that they've got Linux on that rocket that you're looking at right there, that is pretty cool. Um, so is it Yocto Project, BuildRoot, or are they using an in-house build system? So I'll wait for the answers to roll in there. as we hit a certain number okay oops the answer is build root so hopefully thomas petizoni is still on he can uh he can put a feather in his cap for that one that's pretty cool um 
Sorry, Octo Project. You guys have had your victories. Uh, you you have stuff that's running on the International Space Station and some Mars probes. So uh, we don't feel too bad. Um, okay, according to the Debian Popularity Contest, uh, what text editor is the most popular by Debian users? Is it Vim, Emacs, or Nano? Uh, and this, di this uh, picture obviously shows uh, how many fingers keys you have to hold down in order to work effectively with Emacs. Okay, let's uh, show the answer. And the answer is Nano, actually. Of course, that's, uh, I think that's the reason for that is they default that. But uh, this chart, if you look at it, it actually goes all the way back to 2010. Nano's been popular for forever. So the stats have really not changed that much. By the way, the, the graph, uh, this chart, the um, axis on the left-hand side, that's percentage. So a little close to, between 15 and 20% over time, people running Nano. Okay, and let me see how we're doing on people. Okay, got one more question for you here. Okay, about how many of the reported buy credits for bug fixes patches in the 5.6 kernel are for automated testing systems? Is it 20%, 35%, or about 45%? I'm going to take a sip of water. Okay, we've got a fair number of people have answered that now. Uh, and the answer is about 35%. So if you look, the top, actually the top three reported by lines for bug fixes, uh, at least in 5.6, are from automated testing systems. Uh, I'm a big fan of automated testing. I, for one, welcome our new automated testing overlords. Uh, pretty soon, if, if we can get that number up to 100%, we can all uh, go uh, sit on a beach uh, drinking margaritas or something uh, while robots are testing the kernel for us. Um, so we're down to just a few people left. I think I'm going to what, do one more question. Uh, so. This is which of the following is not running the Linux kernel? Oh, sorry, I got to do this side too. Which of the following is not running the Linux kernel? Is it the Mars Opportunity Rover, US nuclear submarines, or the Large Hadron Collider? So two of those three are running Linux. So which one do you think it is? Which one is it not? Which one is not running Linux? Oh, I'm running out of time here. Okay. So we're getting really low on time. I need to leave a couple of minutes, so we're going to have to wipe this out. Okay, so uh, the rover actually runs VxWorks. That's right, people. Nuclear submarines are running, uh, are running uh, Linux. Actually, they're not controlling the sub. It's used for the sonar systems, but it's still pretty impressive. Okay, so uh, a bad thing happened. I eliminated everyone. Uh, so I'm going to try this one last time and see what happens. Did that work? Yeah. Okay, so four people are still in. I'm going to declare those people winners. Uh, AKS, Dub Dub, Do Ya Ya, Yule, and Barrow. Oh, is that uh, Barrow Rosencrantz? No, oh, that's, that's uh, hopefully. Uh, well, or someone else named Barrow, that would be good too. So there we go. We have four more winners. Uh, and uh, we're going to switch games now. So that was the trivia section of our game. And now I'm going to start uh, a different section of the game. Uh, it's rock, paper, scissors. So um, let me go to the instructions for that. Let me see here. Okay, so look back at the screen here. Let me see if this, this works. 
Okay, so our second game is rock, paper, scissors. And uh, we're, it's got the traditional rules. Oh, let's see here. So rock beats scissors, scissors cuts paper, paper covers rock. If you beat the presenter, you stay in the game. Uh, so, and I think we're only gonna have time to do one round of this because we're, we're getting close to the end here. But we still have some prizes left, uh, so uh, yeah, okay. So let's let's we'll have to do a couple of rounds. So here's here's how it works. Uh, we start the game. I'm going to put it on this screen. So go back to the game, uh, use your account, and start deciding what you want to throw. Now the rule is you have to beat the presenter. So if you tie with the presenter, that still counts as a loss, uh, and. Uh, you still have a chance to win. We're gonna do this one a little bit quicker though, because uh, like I said, we're running out of time. So make sure you get your answer in. I don't know why it's taking so long to, okay, here we go. Okay, the host threw rock. So uh, 92 people are still in. Let's go for the next one. I don't have to explain a bunch of stuff here, so start throwing again for the next one. The presenter was uh, Rock. If you threw paper, you won that round. So uh, choose the next one. Okay. Host threw Rock again. <laughs> And I apologize. If you're new to ELC, uh, you may not know this, but uh, our tradition is that we always throw a rock twice at the beginning of this game. I know that gives an unfair advantage to, <laughs> to people <laughs> who, uh, who are newbies uh, at the conference. Uh, but uh, anyway, it is what it is. Uh, sorry. So how many did we get? Uh, we got a lot of people eliminated on that one. Um, so now that I've said that that's what my rule is, of course, you'll have to wait and see what I do at ELC Europe. Uh, so. Okay, answers are rolling in. Okay. Okay, let's go ahead and show the result. Host through scissors this time. Um, and uh, that takes us down to, let's see, 23. That takes us down to seven. So I'm going to go ahead and declare the winners. These are the people who have won uh, the Rock, Paper, Scissors Challenge. So congratulations to those people. Um, so uh, that actually is it. Uh, that's, that's as simple as it is. Uh, we are very close to running out of time. I just have a couple of closing remarks I'd like to to share with you. Um, so what an interesting year it's been. Uh, between uh, COVID-19 and a lot of civil unrest, uh, uh, there's been a lot of uh, a lot of stuff to think about, a lot of changes in, in people's lives, uh, a, a lot of stress for people to deal with. Um, and I just had some observations of my own. I, I, you know, like a lot of people, I've been browsing the internet. Uh, I became a, a armchair epidemiologist, uh, learning about COVID and uh, stuff like that. Uh, in terms of the civil unrest, one of the best suggestions I saw on the subject of the societal harmony was a, a joint statement by the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP uh, in the United States, and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Those two groups got together and issued a joint statement. And one of the things that they had in their statement uh, just I thought was really remarkable and, and uh, insightful. And it said, we invite people of goodwill everywhere to look for ways to reach out and serve someone of a different background or race. Everyone can do something. And uh, there's a lot of psychology behind that statement. Uh, doing an act of service for someone, I think is one of the best ways to uh, learn about them and understand them better. And so reach out and uh, try to do an act of service for someone else. Um, when you look at open source, I'm going to tie it back to open source here. If you if you look at the nature of open source, open source is all about a communal effort, really, to make the world a better place. Um, as developers, we like developing technology, uh, and we get focused on the technological details. And you know, can I shave this many cycles off of this, or you know, make sure that the locking is correct here, or protect the security here. 
in our focus on that, sometimes I think we might miss that fundamentally we are giving a gift to the world. Um, we are, uh, sorry, I gotta close this off here. Uh, open source is, is really an act of service to the world. Um, and it's, it's a great contribution that all of us are making, uh, but it's not a personal act of service. And uh, because of COVID-19, uh, I literally am working in my basement all day, every day. Uh, and, it, and it is stressful. And uh, uh, what, what I just want to suggest is that let's keep doing the coding, uh, but also when we can, let's go out and interact with other people. Um, uh, we can make the world a better place uh, through our contributions to open source. I've really been excited by the diverse international group of people who uh, participated in ELC as I saw people arriving on the Slack channel and announcing where they were from. It's really exciting to, to know that there's such a, uh, a wide, uh, diverse and geographically diverse uh, group of people who are all working together towards a common co cause. And while you're out there coding, uh, don't forget to also reach out to others and especially make an effort to uh, uh, touch the life of someone who is unlike yourself. So with that, I will say uh, thank you for attending ELC. Uh, I hope that you had a, a great experience with our online virtual event. I hope that you learned something new that will benefit you in your career uh, and in your open source contributions. And I really hope to see you next year. Uh, and, I, and I mean that in the very literal sense, it would be great to be able to see you all. Uh, so thank you very much and uh, uh, appreciate your participating and uh, good day and good night.